going to enter stuff into. Um, it contains the um, event handler to go and handle the event that we're interested in. In our case, it's clicking a button. And finally, it has the, the logic to do the operation. So this is like everything in one. All right. We know that it's good programming practice typically to separate things out. But that's a little more complicated. So our first example, we're just uh, having everything all rolled up into one. And when I execute it, it looks like this. And again, we get a display where I enter the temperature and set a grade. As I start to type, those are events. But I don't want to do anything with those events. So I don't have a listener for those events. I could if I wanted to. I could, for example, get rid of the button and have it live as I'm typing in. It does a conversion. If I type in 1, it gives me 1 centigrade converted to Fahrenheit. If I type in then a 2, it will give me 12, and so on down the line. But that's not how this application works. All right. So yes, that is an event to type something in the box. No, I don't have a listener for it, because I don't want to do any code as soon as they type it in. I want to wait until they press the button. So that's an event, and it has a listener associated with it, because I want the ability to detect that event, all right, and then do something. So I click the button, and it tells me that 12 centigrade is 53.6 degrees Fahrenheit. If I put garbage in here, something that's not numeric, it tells me that it's invalid input. And if I put nothing in, it tells me invalid input. All right. So let's look and see how all this fits together. Again, we started looking at this, but let's go in more detail. First thing, we have a few imports here. We import Java Swing. Java Swing is the um, library, it's the package, that contains all of the GUI pieces. So text box buttons, the sort of stuff that you see in the GUI of any um, programming language. All right, Java has its versions of them. So that, that is contained in the Java Swing package. And we, in, we import everything in. We also imp are importing an AWT. And AWT is sort of related to uh, um, Swing um, for an action listener and an action event. All right? Now, right off the bat, our first GUI extends JFrame. Whoa. Almost fell out of the chair. Extends JFrame and implements the action listener. All right. Now we know that uh, we know what extends means. It means it is a. So this code is a JFrame. What is a JFrame? Well, it's this right here. It's a window that we can put stuff in. All right. And it implements action listener. So that's an interface. Um, again, we think of that as being weak uh, is a. This, this object is also is a action listener. And maybe more precisely, we can say that this class can serve the role of an action listener. All right? That's another way to sort of look at an interface, is we're saying, if we say that this class implements that interface, we're saying that this class can serve in the role of whatever the interface is. So a bird can serve in the role of a flying thing. All right? A, uh, a, a, a uh, let's think of your um, example. A, a, um, the examples we did in class. Oh, a person, uh, a student can serve in the role uh, of an email recipient. So when you see implements, you can kind of think can serve in the role. Well, what, thank you very much. 
what qualifies a class to serve in the role of an action listener or any other interface? That means that it has the necessary methods that were defined in that interface. So in this case, when I say that first GUI implements action listener, I'm promising that it will have the relevant methods that exist in action listener. And it will implement all of those methods. There really is only one method that you need to implement to be an action listener. And that method is action performed. So it's the only method that you need to implement to be an action listener is to say action performed. All right. So this class has an action perform method in it, so it can serve in the role of action listener. Okay. So this is going to have the code again. Remember, everything's in this 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 example is is in this one class. It has the main method, it has the GUI itself, it has the Fahrenheit to centigrade conversion, and it is the the class that's going to handle the clicking of the button. Now, just to prove my point, if we were to get rid of this function, action performed, it wouldn't compile. Because we promised that it's going to implement action listener, that it can serve in the role of action listener, but we didn't have this method, action performed. So if I put it back in, it's back to compiling again. All right. So this has the code that we're going to do when we press the button. Probably should indent these. Action event is the argument. Think of the action event as being information about what just happened. It's like the report of what just happened. You know, this happened, this button got clicked, or whatever. We can use that for a variety of different things. One of the things that we can do, for example, is we could use the same listener for several different buttons. All right. Somehow the code would have to know which button was the one that actually got clicked, though, if we use the same action listener for three buttons. How would we know that? We would know that through the action event. All right. The action event contains a bunch of things. Exactly what happened? Any modifiers? Like, did you control click versus um, click? When it happened. So when did they click that button? If we need to, we can we can we can get that. A parameter string. Things that inherits from event object is get source, and get source is the relevant thing. Because we can look to see which button got pressed. So we can look to say, hey, was button A or button B got pressed? All right. So if we use the same action listener for two different buttons, well, we could use the get source to determine which of the two buttons got, got pressed. And we could, have, we could have if statements to say, if button A got pressed, do button A things. If button B got pressed, do button B things. Um, Sometimes that would be, would be valid. Uh, I'm thinking, for example, if, if you wrote a tic-tac-toe game. You essentially, when you play tic-tac-toe, if you wrote a game to play tic-tac-toe, 
you'd have a series of boxes that you could click on, right, to put your spot. And then the computer would put its spot, or maybe the other player would put their X or O down. All right? When you click on the box, the same thing happens, right? If it's X's turn, you put an X there. If it's O's turn, you put an O there. You then look to see if someone won. All right? That would be essentially the code for a Java version of tic-tac-toe. All right? Now, it doesn't matter which one you clicked on. That's the same process. The only thing that matters is which one you put the X in or the O in, whoever's turn it was. So it would be kind of silly to have nine action listeners there. All of them did exactly the same thing, except one would put the X in one location, one would put the X in the next location, one would put the X in the next location. All right? It'd be better just to have one and figure out which one got clicked and put it in that location. So you could do that. Um, unless I have a good reason to, I will generally make one listener per button, though. If, uh, unless it's a situation like that, where essentially all the buttons or all the things I'm clicking on are the same. All right. So an action event is sort of the report of what, what actually just happened. Because we can use the same listener for a variety of things. So in some cases, we might want to know exactly what happened. In this case, this is the only, the only um, uh, event that we're interested in is the click of the button. All right. So we know that if it made it to this point, that they clicked the button. So we don't have to look at all at the action event class or action event object. It still gets it because that's part of the method. We have to pass it an action event. All right. However, there's no need for us to worry about the contents of that object. All right, so let's look how this GUI works. First of all, I have the different things on the page. I have JLabel, which is a label that contains the words enter, temperature, and centigrade. I have a text field that I'm allowing up to four, I don't want to say digits, four characters. I have a button that is labeled with convert. And then I have a results label that I start out being an empty screen. Those correspond to the four things on my screen. All right, if we run this, four things on the screen. The label that says enter Fahrenheit centigrade, the text box, which in Java is called a text field, the button, and then the results label, which initially doesn't have anything in it. All right. So we define as objects the different pieces of our GUI, all the different controls. Notice the constructor for these accepts different things. And if in doubt, you can look at the constructor to see what things it accepts. The label accepts a text, which is going to set the texts in the label. The text field accepts a number, which uh, says how many, how many characters it will allow. The button uh, accepts a label that's going to correspond to the text on the button. And again, the label has the text that's going to be contained in the label. Now, these classes might have other constructors, too, if there was other things. You could look that up, and you could initialize these. Um, controls these objects, these, these form elements, these GUI elements um, with their constructors. So right now, we have these four things. But really, they're not on our window yet. We just made these things, and they're kind of floating in space. All right? Not really floating in space. They're floating in the heap. All right? They're not associated with any window until we go and add it to our window. So making a label or a text box or whatever doesn't automatically put it on your window. You might think that's weird, but not really. right? There may be, for example, text boxes that only appear some of the time. 
Um, if you check, for example, that you're married, maybe a text box will magically appear saying, what's the name of your spouse? If you check that you live in the United States, maybe a drop down will appear that will have a list of the 50 states that you can pick from. If you pick that you live in Canada, maybe a different drop down will appear that will show you the different provinces in Canada. So just because you have something that could be in the GUI doesn't mean it's going to be there all the time. You could have code that controls it and, and makes it. Um, a good example of that is uh, the registration, um, uh, the, the course search at LC. For example, you pick which department you're interested in. Like maybe you're interested in CISS classes. After you pick CISS, then the drop down gets populated with um, CISS classes. So you could hide that drop down until they've made their selection, and then you could show it. it would be an example. All right, so those are the four properties. They're declared as properties, right? These four things are declared as properties, mainly so that any function within this class can use them, right? That's why you make something a property. When something's really a characteristic of the class that you're defining, and you want to be able to access it anywhere in the class, in any method. So this is a neat little kind of odd trick. What does our main method say? Our main method simply creates an instance of this class. That might seem a little weird. All right, don't we have an instance of this class? Actually, not yet. Right? Because the static, the main method is a static method. It doesn't require an instance of the class. So right now, we do not have a first GUI object. We simply called the main method on the first GUI class. And the main method, what it does is it constructs a new GUI. And what does that do? Well, anytime we say new anything, it calls the constructor. And here's our constructor. All right. We have a couple of statements here. This set visible to true. So we're going to show our window. All right, pretty straightforward. Default close operation is to exit. So in other words, when we close this window, the application is going to finish. We're not going to do anything else. We then create a J panel object. What's a J panel? What's a panel object? Some of you, who are you, who of you are in CISS 243 also? We saw panel objects, right? These serve kind of the same role. What's a panel? Yeah. It's a place for you to put stuff, all right? So, for example, you know, and to group things together. So you can, instead of dealing with each control individually, you can deal with each panel. So sometimes it's useful to do that. I do believe you have to have at least one panel for, um, I, I don't think you can, um, yeah, I think, I think you have to have a panel. I'm not sure if you can add it directly to the J-frame. All right, button convert. This is a key line. All right, so far, these not terribly exciting. Make it visible, tell it to shut down when you close the window, and we're making a little container that we're going to put stuff in. All right, this line is important. Button convert, action, add action listener, this. All right, what does that mean? Well, what is button convert? Button convert is the button that we have up here. Right now, that button object is floating in space, or it's floating in the heap, to be more precise. All right? So it's not on the window yet. But we can still do stuff to it until it gets put on the window, All right, and even after. What we are doing is we're saying, we are interested in this button. When something happens to this button, we want to notice it. We want to detect it. And this is the code 
This object here, what object? Well, the first GUI object is the object that is going to contain the code that's going to handle when someone clicks that button. What code is going to run? Well, the action perform code because that is a code that's defined in the action listener interface. We have to give this method an action listener, right? Set action listener. The argument is of type action listener. So we have to somehow give it an action listener. Can't give it any class. We couldn't put a pizza class in here because a pizza is a, a listener, all right? So we set our action listener to this class or this object, rather. We are able to do that because this class implements the action listener. And by implementing the action listener, it means it contains the action performed method. Excuse me. If it did not contain the action performed method, then we could not make it the action listener. All right. So we have this button. Isn't even on the screen yet. But if it gets clicked, it's calling this code. All right. So what do we do next? We add our things in the, to the panel. So we add LBL temp. We add TXT temp. We add BTN convert. We add LBL results. These are all these objects that we made up here. So we add our label, text field, button, and label. And by default, if we don't specify otherwise, it's simply going to put them in the panel right next to each other horizontally. So we add the first thing to the panel, it gets put in. Second thing, third thing, fourth thing. And it's oriented horizontally by default. We certainly can change this. All right but we're going to add those. Right now, these things still aren't on the window. They're just in this panel. But we're going to say we're going to add to the content pane, that is the thing about the, um, the, thing about the window that we can put stuff in. We're going to add our panel to that content pane. And that's what goes and puts these controls. It puts the panel in the window, and the panel contains those four controls. So now we have this on the screen. And lastly, we set the size of this, this being the first GUI window. So I make it 800 wide by 100 tall. So that's why it's this odd shape. All right. So what happens then? It sits there, all right? It sits there to what happens? To one of those defined events happen, right? Either I close out of it, which I said when I close out, shut down, all right? Or the other event that I'm interested in here is I press the button. So it's sitting here. I can do whatever I want. Do, 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 type in there, nothing happens. Tab, nothing happens. Can click over here, can minimize it, make it bigger, maximize it. Do anything I want. If I close it, of course, it's going to exit. All right. But the only other event that I have code for is the button. So when I type something in and press the button, this kicks in. And what method gets called? The action perform method gets called. And it does its thing. All right? So what is its thing? Well, it's pretty straightforward. I have a double for C, a double for F. I say C equals double parse double txttemp.getText. Why do I need to do this part? Why do I need to say parse double txttemp.getText? 
get taxed. To convert from a string, from a string to a double. Because if I want to do math on this, C is a double. If I want to do math on it, I have to make it a double or some numeric type. Remember, a text field contains just that, text. It contains any text that I want. I'm going to ignore the try-catch for now. We're going to just pretend that everyone behaves themselves and types in the right values. So I put in a legitimate number. In the text box, it's text. It's a string. But that will convert the string into a number. And now C has the value of um, the numeric value of whatever characters I typed into the text box. I then do my math, which is Fahrenheit equals C times 9 divided by 5 plus 32. All right. So now F has the Fahrenheit version. And then I set the label text equal F, so the value in Fahrenheit plus the phrase degrees Fahrenheit. Forget the try catch for now. Or is there is there anything about these three lines that you don't understand? There's getters and setters. There's gets and sets, just like the classes that you made. The get text gives me the value that's in that text box. The set text allows me to put the value in the text box. Notice these were not manipulating properties directly. To access the value of that text box, we use the get method. To set the value of that text box, we use the set method. So we get the text, convert it to a number, do our math on it, come up with an answer, take that answer and put it in a text box. Or put it in the label, rather. And again, the label results is that label that we defined up here. All right, because it's a property, and every function can understand it. And there we go. And so it does a calculation. And then it sits here again until one of our events happens. Either we close it or we do another calculation. Now, let's say I type garbage in here. Let's look at the exception. What happens? Well, I click, con first of all, nothing happens until I click convert, right? Because I'm not paying attention to any other events in this application other than the click of the button. That's the only event I'm noticing. It's the only event that I've written code for. So I click this. This goes in the gear. Action perform gets called. I do these things. This instruction here is going to fail because it can't take a characters that I've typed into that text box and convert it into a double. So if I type garbage in here, it can't convert that to a double. Therefore, this instruction fails. And it throws an exception. What exception does it throw? It throws an invalid cast exception. Why don't I trap for invalid cast exception? True. I think I think I'm following what you're saying. That makes sense. And more more so than that, that's about the only thing that could go wrong, right? But the only thing where this could mess up is if someone typed in something that wasn't a valid number, All right? That's about the only way this could mess up. This isn't talking to a database where the database could be down. Or we're not using like another object where the object could be null. So I don't really need to catch for any exceptions other than, well, they put in something that wasn't a number. So that's about the only thing that could go wrong with this. You know? Is Java not going to be able to do this computation? Well, as long as C is a number uh, and F is defined as a number, of course it can do that calculation. right? It's not like Java tomorrow is going to say, I can't do math anymore. All right? So that's not going to fail. This isn't going to fail. I'm always going to be able to set the value of a, of a label to a string. All right? So as long as I give it a string, it's going to be able to do it. Really, the only thing that's subject to problems is this. So if something goes wrong, I can assume, I can assume that the, the problem is, is that there was an invalid input in here. And that's what I display the message. I could catch 
Um, invalid cast exception. I could do that if I wanted to, but really there's no need because that's about the only thing that goes wrong. Remember I said you typically want to put try catches around risky operations. Well, dealing with objects that could be null is one example of a risky um, operation. Connecting to anything outside of your application, like a database, would be a second example of a risky operation. And dealing with user input is a third example of uh, a, risky, uh, a risky thing, because you have no idea what they're going to put in, and you have to be prepared for anything. All right? So if there's a problem, I catch it, and I display the error. So if there's no number in there, I try to make it into a number. If that fails, it's going to throw an illegal cast exception. And lo and behold, I'm catching all the exceptions, and I simply display that message. Any question on this? All right. Let's look at our next GUI example. And this will be a surprise to me because I don't remember what the second example looks like. So I compile it. Compiles cleanly. Look at this listing for a second. Does anything seem odd? Well, so far in this class, we've had as many, when something compiles, we've had as many classes as we've had .java files. In this case, we have one .java and we have three classes, three class files. So that's one thing that looks odd. All right. The other thing is look at the name of two of the classes. We have first GUI.java, first GUI.class. OK, that makes sense. That's the sort of thing we've been doing all along. But notice the other two classes. First GUI dollar sign one, first GUI C to F. OK. We'll look at how these get created in a minute. But whenever you see something like that, those are examples of inner classes. Inner classes. Inner classes are classes, as they imply, that are defined inside other classes. Now, you wouldn't do that for something like the pizza. You, would, you, know, you wouldn't put the pizza and the stuffed crust pizza in the same file. It's not a good idea. Does anyone have a guess what those two inner classes are? What kind of class they are? I know, I'm asking you to read my mind or to read code that's not up here. So I don't expect you to know this, yes? They are. They're very closely related to that first GUI class. So they belong together. It's not like there's a pizza and a, a, an order, and you just happen to put them together because you didn't feel like making two files. These two belong linked together. They're listeners. Bingo, we have a winner. All right? The first GUI is a GUI. Those other two are listeners, except they're listeners that have their own classes. Now remember, a GUI and their listeners are very closely related, right? Because the GUI has to know all the stuff that's on. I'm sorry, the listener has to know all the stuff that's on the GUI. So you want those two things like really tightly linked together. They belong together. All right, so let's look at this and see how it works. And then we'll look at the code. All right, this has two buttons. Fahrenheit to centigrade and centigrade to Fahrenheit. Two buttons two listeners. Could we have done it with one listener? Yes. But it seems to me that unless there's a good reason for it, I'd rather have two simple listeners than one complicated listener. All right. 
Now, in the case of, again, of a tic-tac-toe game, um, I'd rather have one complicated listener than nine simple listeners. All right? But one versus two, yeah, I might as well do this. So the difference is, is I put in a value here. If I click Fahrenheit to centigrade, it tells me 100 Fahrenheit is 37 degrees centigrade. If I do centigrade to Fahrenheit, it tells me 100 centigrade is 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So I get a different answer depending on which button I click. All right. Also notice the layout of this is definitely not elegant, but it's different than what we had before. We'll talk about the layout. We probably won't get into the layout today, so we'll ignore that code. I want to focus on the listeners today. But notice that this is not like the first one where things were just stretched out horizontally going down the line. All right. So let's look at this. And as we look at it, let's focus on the listeners. So that'll be the main code that I look at. So I edit this. Uh -huh. I'm not implementing JFrame. I'm not implementing Action Listener. I am extending JFrame, but I'm not implementing Action Listener. That means that this class is not the listener for either of the buttons. This class is not um, serving the role of an Action Listener at all. So it doesn't need to implement the Action Listener. That means it also is not going to have the Action Perform method. All right. What it has is this. And I'm going to skip this one. This one's the second one. Let's look at this. BTN convert CF, add action listener, new C to F. All right? Well, we're creating a new object of class C to F. What is class C to F? Well, it's down here. It's inside, it's completely inside the class of first GUI. All right? It's within the curly brackets, even. Now, the thing about that is it being in the curly brackets means that it can access all the properties of the first GUI class. So I can have code in here that looks at the text box. Because the text box is a property of this class. And this is an inner class. All right? It's defined completely within the other class. Therefore, it can read the properties of its parent class. And parent class might be a bad word. Um, the, the outer class, the class that contains the inner class. So let's just worry about the C to F button right now. Because if we just look at the C to F button, this is almost exactly like the other one. The only difference is we create a new cla uh, class to be the listener. So we have all our stuff. We, we add these things, blah, 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 blah. We do all that. We add all those things on there, and it sits and waits. It sits and waits to what? Till if till someone clicks one of the buttons, the C to F button. What was the action listener for this? It was a new object of type C to F. That's this guy right here. So when we click that that Celsius to Fahrenheit button. This code kicks in. And it's almost like before. We go and we grab the value, we parse it, we do our calculations, we display the results. In the meantime, we, we trap for an error, any errors that occur. Only difference here is our listener is a different class than the GUI. And we said our listener is a new object of this type. And this type 
implements action listener. All right. When this guy compiles, it creates the file like this. First GUI dollar sign C to F. So first GUI, that's the outer class. Dollar sign means it's an inner class. C to F is the name of the inner class. All right. Now I could have here said C to F listener equals, I could do this. I am so predictable. I have that code commented out right below. I could say C to F, CF event handler equals new C to F, and then say button convert CF add action listener to this. This is just sort of a shorthand that, that does it. I don't really need to refer to that event listener object other than tell the button that this is the guy that's going to be handling when you get clicked. So I don't really need a variable name for it. I can create that object right here and add it to the, uh, the action listener for this button. And everything will work the same. And I don't, it saves me the trouble of coming up with a variable name and, and storing a variable for that. And it works the same. So that's pretty similar to what we did in the other example. The last thing we're going to look at, and I'm just going to introduce you to this monstrosity, and I'm just going to leave. And, and you can puzzle over it over the weekend. This is what's called an anonymous class. All right? It's called an anonymous class. What does it mean when you say someone's anonymous? They don't have a name, right? Or you don't know their name, but really they don't, in this instance, it means that they don't have a name. So this class doesn't have a name. All we know is this class implements the interface action listener. So we create a new action listener, and we ain't going to give it a name. All right, we ain't going to give that class a name. And because we're creating an action listener, what does this new anonymous class have to have? It needs an action performed. So this is simply a shortcut that saves us the trouble of even creating an inner class. We define that class like right smack dab here. All right, and the class doesn't even have a name. Because really, we ain't going to reuse this. This listener is written specifically for this GUI for that button. So it's extremely unlikely that we'll be able to reuse this in another project. So we put all the code that defines the class and defines the action perform method right smack dab here. Now, I deliberately did this two different ways in this example to show you two different ways that you can do it. Typically, you'd pick your favorite way and do them all like that, all right? I tend to do this simply because I think this is horribly ugly code, all right? And I get confused, and it's confusing. It's easy to miss, like having an extra bracket or parenthesis or something like that there. So I don't like doing that. I would typically do this. I'd create an object, give it a name, all right, and then say this. That makes the code really concise. And in this way, if I don't care about what happens within the C to F action listener, I don't have to look at that class, because that class is defined way down there. I look at it if I'm interested. I don't look at it if I'm not interested. This sort of uglifies, and that's a new word, um, the code, because I can't like ignore this. It's right there smack dab in the middle of the code. So I have to look at it as I'm scrolling through. So for that reason, I would take that approach. But I don't know. I think some programmers think this is cool, because you, you don't even have a name of a class. You just go and you define a class right there. Boom, there you go. It's kind of concise. I don't really care which way you do it. Uh, but again, do keep in mind I did it the two different ways simply to demonstrate the two different options. Normally, there's no good reason for me doing one the one way and one the other way. It was just me demonstrating the two different ways you could do it.
All right. We'll talk more about this next time. Yes. This bracket? This one? Yes. <laughs> That's exactly the problem, right? What does this belong to? And this is where, like, uh, Notepad++ helps. That belongs to this. Right, exactly. Because remember, if you're defining an action listener, your code looks like this. Action listener parenthesis something and then an end parenthesis. In this case, that something is these 12 lines of code. All right? And whereas in this case, that something is new C to F. All right? So yeah, I could definitely see why that's confusing. All right. These examples, this was in the examples that I posted on uh, whatever day we met earlier this week, Monday. All right, so I'm not going to upload this because I didn't make any changes. So just look at Monday's example for um, both these example GUIs. All right, we'll see you up in lab.